The flip side of the demonstration to Satan is in a way something that gives him more fuel for the fire. Just as there is no shaving of truth and therefore one can go as high as Christ technically. We don't, but we can. So also because there's no shaving of the truth, the, how do you want to call it, the depths to which people can go is unbelievably low. And they go there because they want to. And there are consequences that go with that, which are extremely harsh. I'm not just talking about hell. Actually, the hell that will exist on the outside is nothing compared to the hell that's on the inside. And just as with any disease, you have to quarantine it or it will infect the less diseased or the non-diseased. That's the fundamental of disease. We have no problem, well not no problem, but we have very little problem comparatively understanding and accepting that when it comes to a disease of the body. If you got gangrene, you don't cut off the leg, then the gangrene will spread to the rest of the body. So you have to lose the leg. It's a horrible decision to have to make. It hurts. And I'm not talking about just the surgery. Look at all the life that is lived afterwards. And more importantly than that, it's a hard decision to make because nobody wants to kill a part of a thing because it was designed to be whole and healthy and the rest of the body is impacted by the you know two eagles at that point that the leg is infected it's gonna infect the rest of the body if you don't kill it and two you lose the leg. The rest of the body doesn't operate the way it had been when it was healthy. So the other aspect of inserting church is to replace the loss of those who reject God. Those who reject God are like gangrene. Well, I mean, they don't start out like gangrene. They just, because we're all negative on something. It starts out like a cold or stubbing your toe. I mean, there are various forms of negativity. And I'm going to cover that. I've, I've already done the audios. So I've got to post them. on spiritual degeneration, so you can see how bad it is. There are people in this world who instead of just being negative at moments and then flipping back again, they go on this downward path that infects the body of humanity. Literally, that's what sin does. That's why we die. When God said to Adam in Genesis 2.17, dying you will die, that's the way it's translated, but you don't know what it means because it's a stupid translation. <coughs> Should have said, dying spiritually, you will die physically. There is a connection. The body's dependent on the soul. And when the soul sins, the soul fractures. When it fractures, Parts of it get separated, just kind of like an earthquake. Actually, more like a nuclear bomb or Dresden. And the parts that are broken off, as you 
should know from a wide variety of things that happen in daily life, when something breaks off from a hole and you let it stay there, the break becomes bigger and bigger and bigger than the rest of the, the thing that's broken. That's why I talked about the cracked cup. It was supposed the whole cup should have broken apart because it was from top to bottom on one side of the cup. But it didn't because something else was holding it together. I don't know what. Okay, so there's a certain amount of the breakup that occurs and God holds it together. But in this case, of course, we're, I'm making an analogy to negative volition to God. And when it breaks up too much, then it's got to be broken off for the sake of the rest of the body. And then something else has to be grafted in. That's Romans 11. And, you know, healed. A lot of people have had transplants. A lot of people have had skin grafts. It's a very painful thing. But it makes the body whole again. It makes the body well again. There is a perfection in number. There is a perfection in diversity. And if, if truth is going to be free, then it means that some parts of, as it were, the body of a population, here both angels and humans, there is a perfection in diversity in number amongst that whole population. And if part of the population doesn't want God, it's going to have to be broken off. Now, if it wants God again later, well, it can be grafted back in. But it doesn't. If God isn't doing the deed, then you're not getting healed. You're not growing. And you're an infection to the body of Christ. But you're already saved. You can't lose your salvation. Fine. You can lose your position in the kingdom and go to the bottom where you have the least amount of influence. Because true, heaven is free also. Free will is free will now and then. The difference in then is that we don't sin anymore. But we're still free. And if you didn't learn Christ when you were down here, you're free, but your your soul is about the size of a, you know, a dot of sand. Because it's just got you, your decision, and it doesn't have God's decisions that you opted for. So you didn't grow in your soul like Christ did on the cross. So that's the other answer to Satan is, Okay, Satan, you lost at the cross. What did suffering birth? Well, the first thing it birthed was other humans who actually think like Christ. What do you know? Through freedom, without God shaving it, what do you know? This is what you could have had, Satan. In other words, to try to encourage him to change his mind. You got that. He's showing Satan what the benefit was that Satan was going through, that he flunked. And he could have gotten it then, but he rebelled, and he can still get it if he stops rebelling. Same message, of course, as that. On the other hand, if you keep rebelling and you keep saying no, here's what you are becoming. Actually, he's already become that, but you know, here's what you're becoming. And then the, the humans who say no to God demonstrate that too, especially church. Because if we got a high spiritual life, the low that we can go to is unbelievably low. Lower than anybody else. So here's the flip side. If you freely develop in my truth be free plan that my son finished, and yeah, you're technically beaten, but now I want to try to show you that you still got a chance to change your mind. Flip side high. Look at all these dumb bunny humans. Who grew all the way in my son. <clears throat> and look what they became. Look how happy they are. That's the primary testimony. Look how happy they are. If I had shaved truth, they wouldn't be that happy. Flip side. Look at all these believers. 
who rejected my son, and yeah, they're going to heaven, but look how unhappy they are. Look how low they go. And that, of course, reflects Satan and company, their own rejection. The whole thing, the whole God deed thing has this panoramic value of demonstrating to Satan and company a kind of good news call, the gospel out to them. You still have a chance, you can still change your mind. Change it. Which, of course, they're not doing. Meanwhile, down on earth, that same presentation and the same arguments that Satan and company make are all playing out. Now, the difference between what's going on in heaven and the difference of earth is that the sides are already drawn and the parties are already, dis, you know, in their camps in heaven. But on earth, people are, you know, in the process of choosing. And it ain't over until the fat lady sings. Which means you die or the rapture, whichever happens first. And it's also not over even after that because after that, once you've died and you've, you've basically chosen what team you're on. Okay, but the op you can always still change teams even once the lake of fire commences at the end of the millennium. But it's a lot harder to want to want God the longer you persist in being negative. So the infection to the human race down here is an up and front and real center issue. An infection is allowed to happen for so long because it has therapeutic value in, treat, in teaching other people what not to, not to do. And at some point that therapy lesson or the therapy benefit to those not infected ceases. This is the example of Pharaoh. First five plagues, Pharaoh was getting, <clears throat> was kind of on the fence a little bit. When he went back to Moses and say, you know, remove the plague, he was really still debating the matter in his mind. But somewhere during the fifth plague, I forget what that one was, he just, that's it, end of story. He, God is not going to be something he wants. So from the, the last five plagues, a verse that really the, the Calvinists just don't understand, the last five plagues it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God didn't harden Pharaoh's heart. God was accused by Pharaoh in Pharaoh's heart. In other words, anything that God did, nice or not nice, at that point, would have made no difference. So anything God does at all, unless he just stops doing, is going to make Pharaoh more negative. God's very existence and actions of any kind, Pharaoh's just going to become more negative no matter what. Well, is God going to stop doing something? Because, you know, there are all these people who aren't saying no. No, God's going to keep on doing. Truth be free. Okay, Pharaoh, you can go as negative as you want, just like, you know, believers can be as positive as they want. See, freedom has two sides. So, Satan's just getting more negative every day, no matter what God does. People down here on the ground get more negative every day no matter what God does. No matter what you say to some people, it's just going to, in their minds, they're going to use it as evidence that they should be negative. That's just, that, that's just how they think. And they can look real nice on the outside and they can behave real nice, but inside their soul, they're 
just getting blacker and blacker by the day because they want to. They like their position. They like being negative. They always justify to themselves that they're walking in the light. That's what one John is talking about. You have the painting of a picture in one John of dark Christians and light Christians. They're all saved. But there are people who have believed in Christ and of course those who haven't that in their minds reach a sort of point of no return. It's a sort of anti-maturity where whatever is presented to them as an argument pro or con God they will twist and use to justify their own position. And it doesn't even matter if the argument's stupid. They just do this to everything in the final stages. Everything they see, everything they think, everything they think they know is proof that they're right by golly and by Godfrey. Okay. Now, for us other humans down here are sort of in the middle. We haven't reached that point of no return, pro or con. Because you reach a point of no return with Christ too. Spiritual maturity is where that point is reached. And and it's basically you're just refining in it. Okay, in your soul at some point in your life, you will turn on positive to God or you will turn negative to God. There is a point in every spiritual life where you just stay on, even though you still sin and everything. It's not about sin, it's about rejecting God. It's about rejecting His plan. Or you, or you reach your ceiling and you just turn off. Abraham went to his ceiling about this sun thing. And he just stayed on. Other people, they reach the ceiling of whatever their big bugaboo is with the relationship in God. And they just turn off. And they quit the course. For those who aren't there yet, this phenomenon of a few saying yes and staying on, and the many, overwhelmingly many, 90%, say no and quit the course, there's got to be a certain amount of um, surgery for the sake of the body as a whole so you're losing, you get to the point where there's a gangrene or there's a cancer or there's something that's got to be cut out. Now, a side issue about that is you're in a periphery, you're around certain people. They're in their own state internally with respect to the God question. You know, there's a turn on point when it comes to the gospel. There's a sort of waffling before that point. And then there's also a point that, that people are just going to say no to the gospel no matter what arguments are made. By a similar token, the same arguments, that the same kind of flux applies post-salvation. People are going to be waffling about the spiritual life for most of their spiritual life. And at some point they're just going to say no. They'll tell themselves they're saying yes, but they're really saying no. And for the rest of the people who aren't at that point, it's it's an infection. Thought is contagious. It's an infection. So God has to decide, just like he did with Pharaoh, how long does he let the thing go on? So that a person who's negative in your periphery remains around. And there's also this exigency, especially as a king, you have to decide this, and this is a f decision every king faces. At what point do you cut the person off? First of all, in your mind, and maybe physically, in your relationship. That's a real tough decision to make, just as it is on the operating table. You know, as Christ was illustrating that with Israel, and he said, you know, he did the parable of the fig tree where the vine dresser, as it were, I'm mixing metaphors, said, oh, well, you know, let me let me put some new fertilizer on it and water it better, you know, one more year. The same argument as Sodom and Gomorrah. 
there were ten righteous in there, you're going to destroy the whole city. And so there's a limit at which you yourself, in your own relationships with people, have to decide where you're going to go. When do you cut them off? And there's all kinds of different relationships in life. Talking to somebody in a YouTube comment is a kind of relationship for that moment. And a person will say something and you realize, you know what? This is a pointless discussion. You cut them off. You just don't talk to them anymore. The same thing is true in, you know, more difficult relationships when you have with people that are, you know, close to you. And then you got business relationships, relationships that are with acquaintances, the whole bit. When you cut somebody off, and if you cut somebody off in your mind, that's the first stage. You're going to have to kind of develop a policy about that. And the policy with people is always based on facts and circumstances. You can't set a hard and fast rule. You can't cut, maybe you don't cut them off entirely, but you cut them off in your mind to a certain extent. And then there's the question of, well, how do you, how do you interact with them? How often do you see them? In what capacity? And you have to make all those decisions. And you then also have to make the decision about, sometimes, drastic measures, just like gangrene, you cut off the leg, you cut off association with them. These are the same kinds of decisions that God has to make as king. You don't want God? Okay, you don't get God. Because that's consistent with truth be free. You want me, to the extent you want me, you get me. To the extent you don't want me, you don't get me. Therefore, the person is free to choose how much. And of course, that also means that the door always remains open. That's like what he said to, Sa to Cain. The sin bearer is at the door of your volition. Not sin is crouching at the door. Must have been a spiritual child who translated that. The sin bearer is at the door of what? Your volition. You want me? I'm still here, but I'm not talking to you. I didn't go anywhere. I'm just, we don't have, you know, diplomatic relations have been broken off. But I'm still here. Okay, so... In your life, you're going to have to make those same kinds of decisions, and you're learning more about God that way, why He decided not to bless or to cut off. And most of all, and this is also a demonstration to Satan, we're seeing just how negative negative is. Just how pointless it is to try to reason with a negative person. You can't do it. You can't throw money at the poor and expect it to work. They don't have the underpinnings of knowledge to grapple with how do you use money. Same thing is true for spiritual wealth. The gospel, doctrines, they want to be negative and dig in their heels on a certain position that is patently untrue. They're patently incompetent with respect to reading Bible. They're patently negative to anything that suggests that their position is wrong. You can't talk to them. You just can't. So you cut them off. Because then you're wasting your time. And not only that, but there's an infection that goes on. Because the longer you argue with a person you know is just going to be a pointless thing. The more you're encouraging that person to play his games on himself, and the more you're encouraging somebody who's not so familiar with the way that person is to think that that person is somehow better or less um, negative than the person really is. So you got a two-sided problem there as a king. 
one, how much time should you be spending when it's pointless? And the answer is you don't. And two, what do you do with this person in your interaction for the sake of those around who can't discern how bad that person has gotten, how cattywampus he's gotten? You have to, there's some kind of censuring you're going to have to do. As a warning to the person, because the door still stays open, he can always change his mind. And you gotta you gotta phrase it in a certain way such that those watching the interaction can also be warned. Don't be like this other person because he's going down the road, the rat the hole with the rabbit hole with Alice. Because they won't have enough discernment to know that. So that means a certain amount of harsh behavior. God exhibits the harsh behavior by using discipline. Most of the time, the divine discipline that people get is God just standing off. Letting them have the, the, the consequences of their own bad decisions. Because again, with, as with Pharaoh, the more God did, the more Pharaoh would be negative. Well, God had to deliver the people out of Israel one way or another. So he's going to keep doing something for their sake. Knowing full well that Satan's just going to, I mean, um, Pharaoh is just going to get more and more negative. He's got to preserve the ones who are still well. I mean, relatively speaking well. They're positive, but they've got maybe two dots of positive, or ten dots, or a hundred dots, but there's at least one. In Pharaoh's case, it was not only zero, it was going below zero. So he's got to deliver the positive out from the negative. And at the same time, of course, he's cutting off the negative, which is, you know, dramatically illustrated by the Red Sea. So, there are some harsh decisions in life that we end up having to make, just as God does. And we understand better why He does that. We understand better how it is that, no, you can't just keep mollycoddling people in that position. You have to cut them off and you have to warn them and you have to also warn them for the sake of others. Well, that all that's illustrated by the exit of, of Israel from Egypt. And you're going to have a lot of Egypts in your life. And God will take you out of certain situations and in other situations you yourself have to realize what's going on and choose to be out and <clears throat> to a certain extent, in a lot of situations, you don't actually move out. You wait for God to move you out, but you make the decision in your mind. This can happen, unfortunately, it's the most painful, and Christ warned us about it, inside families. Mother against daughter, remember that phrase when he's talking about it? People will divide over doctrine, they will. And you have to decide what kind of association you have. And it's particularly dicey when you have parents and children and um, spouses. There's the, you know, all too frequently in a marriage, there's a spouse who's positive and a spouse who's not. Since you're married, you're not supposed to divorce. So the spouse who's positive is supposed to just hang in there and wait for God to deliver just like in Egypt. They waited on God to take them out. The plagues preceded it, however, for a whole year. They didn't, you know, take their implements or whatever they had and just go to war with Pharaoh there on the spot. They waited for God to deliver them out of Egypt. Same thing in marriage. You wait for God to deliver you. If you know that, that you know, you're supposed to cut yourself off from your spouse, well, you sort of cut yourself off in your mind, but you are still married, you have a certain husband-wife relationship that still must be maintained. But obviously it's a lot smaller than it could have been 
and it's very painful, extremely painful. And you wait on God to deliver you out. And you will. Either the other spouse is going, the negative spouse is going to want the divorce sooner or later, later, or the spouse is going to die. One or two. And you wait on God to determine how that ought to play. Meanwhile, you're still learning Christ under an extremely set of uh, extremely painful circumstances. The same thing with parents and kids. Sometimes it's the kids who are positive and the parents who are negative. Sometimes it's the parents who are positive and the kids who are negative. Sooner or later, there's going to be a break. But the basic rule is that the one who's positive waits on the Lord to deliver him out of the, the, the situation and tries to cooperate as much as there can be with the one who's negative. But cooperating does not mean mollycoddling at any point. You cannot afford to give the negative person the idea that he's right, especially since he's going to take everything you say and do as justification for him being right. At the same time, you can't beat him over the head with the warning either, because that's just going to add fuel to the fire to his own idea that he's right. So what it ends up meaning, unfortunately, and most of the time, is a kind of silence. And be that silence grows bigger. You don't talk about the difference. Because the person already knows you believe and he doesn't. He already knows that you're positive and he's negative. That's his big contention. He wants desperately to get you to agree with his side. Because all negativity is insecure. A person who's busy shaking his fist at God is very insecure. Desperately needs the agreement of other people. To buttress his own failing ego. The sin nature is an inferiority complex. That's its real root character. And an inferiority complex is always looking for outside support. So the negative person in any relationship you have is constantly going to be grabbing at you for support. It's going to be trying to evangelize you to agree with them. And this hurts even more if you actually love the person or care about the person because it's going to be real hard to be harsh with somebody you care about. But you've got to do it. How often, how much, in what way? Well, those are all questions you have to talk to God about. But you do have to do it. At very least, in your mind, you have to divorce yourself from that person. In your mind. To what extent you do it also physically, well, that depends on the kind of relationship you have, the facts on the ground. But the point is, is that this negativity is contagious, even as the positiveness is contagious. And it's a question of, okay, do at what point do you excise the contagion? I'll cover more about that in the next increment.